right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Happy to welcome back to the show, uh, The Bulwarks, Will Salatan. Will, welcome. How hey, are you doing, thanks, man? Matt. I'm doing great. I'm like all excited for the eclipse that I'm not going to be able to watch because I had, um, I don't know about you, I had eclipse glasses from the last eclipse, the little, you know, cardboard things. And I had them in a, like a box and my wife made me clean up, which is the sensible thing to do. And I probably told myself, hey, when's the next eclipse? I think I probably chucked them. I was sure I had them. So I don't have them. And now I'm like, I read in the Washington Post, you're not supposed to like do the shoebox thing or you're not supposed to do anything close to looking into this. Do you, have you read up on this? I have not. Look, I don't trust a little piece of plastic to protect my <laughs> eyes. I just don't. I mean, how do I know that the person who sold them to me, maybe they made a mistake? Who knows? So I don't trust it. And I remember when I was a little kid, there was an eclipse and it seemed even at the time to be much ado about nothing. Uh, so I am here talking to you, I think, while it's happening. Am I right? No, no, it's not. It's well, it's going to hit you. Uh, I don't know, probably around the same time as it's going to hit DC. It's going to like it's it's going because it's going northeast. So you're going to so get what time, more. Look, what is it like? What time three, of day it's is supposed it to be? Out? 320. And okay. we're recording this before the, the eclipse comes through. It's going to be 320 in D.C. It should be around the same time in West Virginia, I'm thinking. Because uh, and you, you're just going to get more more eclipse than we are. You're going to get like closer to totality. Aren't you excited? No, not really. I think it's <laughs> overblown. And the media has. But look, you know, let them have fun with it. CNN is all in on this, man. I mean, just all day long. CNN is owning. This is like the Malaysian jet or you're missing Malaysian plane, except for a day. So, uh, you know, good for them. It's, it's, it is a somewhat positive. Unlike that story, this is a somewhat kind of lighthearted story. So I'm glad we have something to talk about that's not just, you know, <laughs> coups and bloodlettings and shootings and, and all that. So. Right. And, you know... For the for the doomers out there, the people who think the eclipse is the end times, there there are actually people saying like you know there's all this stuff happening and the eclipses, and as though this weren't in the cards the whole time, right? That's the way that the trajectories work. But for anybody who's actually seeing or hearing this, you're you're if if you're seeing or hearing it, then the eclipse did not end life as we know it. So that's great, isn't it? And if it did, then this nothing we say we say matters. So I won't be canceled <laughs> for anything we say. All right. Well, let's get down to business. A lot of just different things to cover. Um, I want to start, let's start political, uh, then I'll get a little more serious. But I mean, everything's serious, but this is sort of a political story. This was a, a, a Politico story, and, and I think it was looking at different polls that showed that increasingly young people are supporting Donald Trump and older people are supporting Joe Biden. And I don't know if this is actually true. It could be that the polls are wrong. Um, and part of the reason it could be that young people aren't just answering their phones, their own cell phones, or they're ignoring the text or whatever. Um, but if it is happening, Will, it's a big deal and very weird. And it means it, we already knew all the old rules were out the window, but now for real, all the old rules are out the window. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But what was your take on this story? Well, okay. So there, there's an obvious reason why some young people have turned against Joe Biden and it's Gaza, right? And you can argue about the merits of the thing, but there is a, everybody, anecdotally, a lot of people have experienced this, you know, angry young lefties who are just like, would otherwise be Biden supporters who are like, he's a genocide supporter, yada, yada. And, you know, in the bulwark, we've argued against this. That's not what he is. But the point is, there's a simple explanation for why it could be true that Biden is doing worse. The, the larger point, though, to me is the fir this is not the first time polling has shown. This has been going on for months. And the first time it happened, people were like, oh, my God, Trump is leading Biden among people 18 to 29 or whatever the number was. And people just didn't believe it. Pundit class people who did not believe it, like, oh, that, you know, that can't be true. We know that that poll is, is wrong because that's not the way young people are. And then it's happened again and again since then. So I just think this is an occasion. I don't know, Matt, why this is going on. I, my God, is the simplest explanation I have. But I know this. Whenever you hear a pundit saying, oh, that can't be true. You know, that poll should be, that's a fake poll or like something's wrong with that poll. Be suspicious. Like you can be suspicious of the poll, but I would be very suspicious of anti-poll 
punditry because very often it's people who like say liberals who don't want it to be true that young people have turned against Biden and they're closing their eyes and saying, you know, that's not real. When what they should be doing is asking, if this is real, why is it? And what should we be doing about it? So Gaza, we'll get to more of that in a minute. I think that's certainly part of it. I think Biden's age or the appearance of him, his age is is part of the problem. Now, young people, surprisingly, a lot of times like old people, right? Bernie Sanders had a pretty good youth following, as I recall. I think Ronald Reagan did pretty good with the youths of America. So it's not just age, but I think something about Biden, the way he presents is turning them off. And I do think this opens the door potentially for RFK Jr., um, where is he? Has he has he talked about anything uh, about uh, Gaza? Has he has he waited on that? I don't know if he's talked about Gaza in particular. Um, so because he, he, he this would potentially be an opportunity for him. I don't know what he really believes deep down, but you would think he could maybe seize on this if, in fact, he is there to play spoiler to uh, help Donald Trump and defeat Joe Biden. Well, the th- I mean. I should look at what RFK has said about Israel and Gaza. He, I know that he, his general shtick is anti-government and against the defense establishment and against the, uh, this week he went out uh, within the last few days, was on CNN and was talking about how Biden is a bigger threat to democracy than Trump is and was saying uh, Biden is like sicking the FBI and the CIA on people and doing all this surveillance. So it's like, Classic yeah. sort of he said he's the first president to censor a political opponent. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, he's, look, you, you know the bulwark view on this, which I share, which is that Donald Trump is way bigger threat to democracy than any other politician. And so whatever, whatever your issues are with Biden and surveillance, they're just like the issues people had with George W. Bush. They're like much lower tier of, of concern. But anyway, what RFK is doing politically by making this policy argument is he's connecting with a Trumpy audience, right? Like here's this guy who's supposed to be the lefty and everyone was afraid that RFK was going to take votes from Biden. And instead what's happened is RFK is like, oh no, like Joe, the Biden regime is like out to get all of us, which is exactly the Trump message, right? And, and to, to the end, even his isolationism connects with the, with the Trumpy isolationism. And so you have this weird phenomenon of this is starting to alarm the, the people on the right, right? That like RFK is saying, hey, I'm just like Trump, which means he's going to start, if people start to believe that, then people who might otherwise vote for Trump will vote for RFK instead of drawing votes it, from I mean, Biden. It, it could happen. Anything is possible. But I, I'm still operating under the premise that if anything that keeps... And by the way, I think I heard somebody say this on the bulwark the other day, that Trump can't get 50 percent. Uh, this is Ron Brown's Brown's team. Yeah, I think he said this. So Trump can't get to 50 percent. Trump's going to get 46, 47 percent. And um, anything that allows Trump to win with 46 or 47 percent helps Trump. Right. So if RFK Jr., a third party, I think is more likely to hurt Biden and help Trump. And I do think that there are young voters and possibly even young minority voters who would never vote for Trump, but they might vote for RFK because they don't like Joe Biden. They think he's too old. They don't like his stance on Gaza. So I'm still in the camp of, and maybe this is just like paranoia. I'm not sure, but I'm in the camp of like the fix is in. This is all. And remember it was, and now I'm repeating Liz Smith's talking points. Okay. Um, but remember Steve Bannon encouraged, uh, RFK to run as a third party candidate to run for president. Um, I think one of the big funders of RFK Jr. Super PAC is also a big Trump donor. Um, and so it does, it just, it seems to me something fishy's up. It, okay. So it may be, it may be that something is fishy up, but Matt, this is one of my favorite things about political punditry, which is we're so wrong. <laughs> I mean, we get things really wrong. And so the people, the political operatives who try to be diabolically clever, they also get things wrong, right? Yes. So like, I mean, the classic thing, as you know, is campaign finance reform, which is half the time produces an effect completely opposite of what was intended. And, and so if Bannon thought that this was going to help Trump, I mean, it would be 
just poetic for it to actually do the have the opposite effect of what he intended. Like he was conniving, but in a self-destructive way. It and, happens. And, yeah, it does, it does happen. Unintended consequences, my friend. And this used to be a conservative insight, epistemological modesty that we don't know. Central planners, we we can't figure it all out. We can't pull all the strings. And uh, it's actually a fatal conceit to think that we can do that. But right. I digress. So so but let me ask you about the the 50 percent thing. I mean, you st you know, if Biden gets 49 percent and Trump gets 48 percent in Georgia or whatever, I mean, I think that literally is what happened. I can't remember exactly, but like that. It doesn't matter, right? Like it, he doesn't need to hit fifty percent. So, as if somebody who would otherwise not vote shows up and votes for RFK instead, like I don't think that affects the calculus. It's just if they would have otherwise voted for Biden. Yeah, I think it's. I agree. I think it's taking votes away. And the the premise is that people who like Trump like Trump, but um, there are people who, given a binary choice would hold their nose and vote for Biden. But if you give them an out, if you give them someone else, they will go with that someone else. Whereas Trump voters, there may only be 46% of them, but they are sticky at this point. If you've been with Trump through all this, you are with Trump. Look, again, we see through a glass darkly. Nobody knows nothing. Um, but that's my, uh, that's my instinct at this point. Yeah, no, I... I, I think that makes sense. Um, it does, and it does. I just thinking more about your point. It is true that if that RFK can attract people and take them out of the pool of potential Biden voters, so that like if the Biden campaign is thinking, look, in order to pull out Georgia or whatever state it is, here's the here's a pool of young people we could go to. To the extent that RFK locks those people in, he does take them out of that pool, and that does hurt the Biden campaign. All right. Well, let me ask you about we've been talking about Gaza from a domestic political standpoint. But um, just if you would just give us a land. I know you've been reading about this, writing about this, watching this. Um, where are we with Israel and Gaza as of today? Well, we don't know exactly. And the reason is Israel pulled like a whole division out. They, they pulled out nearly all of their troops, I think, out to the to the border. And it's what's not clear is, are they are they doing that to prepare for a ceasefire or are they doing that to prepare for a ground assault on Rafa, which would be exactly what Biden told them not to do? I think the signs are probably that they're moving toward the ceasefire. I mean, Netanyahu said the other day something like we're one step away from victory, which is, you know, because the impatience, the patience is wearing out all over and the strike on the seven world world central kitchen workers, you know, it sort of accelerated this. The, the Biden administration essentially threatening. Netanyahu. I mean, one of the craziest things to me, Matt, was John Kirby, the Biden national security spokesman. He goes out on TV for the last several days and he says, now we're not, they, are you threatening to withdraw support from us? Oh, no, no, no. We're not threatening. Are you using leverage? No, no, we're not doing, we're just saying that if they don't change what they're doing, we're going to change what we're doing. And he literally said on one of the shows this weekend, you know, we'll change our support. Well, that is a threat. Yeah. And the threat's working. And just to be clear to like conservatives out there, this is not the first time this has happened. I think David Frum pointed out that the Reagan administration also did this. Like, this is not the first time that the United States government has told Israel, you got to change your policy or we're going to change our level of support or the way yeah, we're supporting. Yeah, I think in the Bush administration as well. Um, it is sort of an unfortunate thing that if you're Israel, um, you're expected to take care of your own people and make sure that you don't do too much damage to the to the enemy and you you've got a short time you don't want a clock there's a clock i mean there's a a, a shot clock basically that you're going to get x number of days or weeks to try to get your hostages back and at some point um the american resolve will give give out and uh we won't have the stomach for it and we're gonna and and i mean honestly Joe Biden, this, this is really, I think this is super bad for Joe Biden. Maybe I'm stating the obvious, but it is such a wedge issue. Um, this is really just dividing Biden's coalition. And I think people assume the war would end and then there'd be like six months 
before the election. And now it's starting to look like, I don't, I don't know about that. What do you say? Yeah, I, that's what I thought. I, I'm, I'm one of those people who thought, you know what, if this is real, like we were talking earlier, young people being pissed off at Biden about this. I said, if it's Gaza, that's good news for Biden politically, because this is going to be over soon. And then it hasn't been over. We're, we're like the six month anniversary. It's still going, you know, maybe we're seeing the signs of an end game, but like, if it, if it keeps going, obviously these, these kids are still going to vote against Biden, but I, I think it'll go away otherwise. But I, I got to say on the merits is good. We've been talking about the politics and I mean, I'm at the bulwark and I work with a lot of folks who are very strongly committed to Israel and, and I support Israel, but, but we've now got 33,000 dead in Gaza. Okay. Israel claims that like 12,000 of them are Hamas. That leaves, you know, like the, sorry, that's 21,000 dead civilians. And the, and the numbers on young people alone, Gaza is very heavily skewed towards young, young people. Large, they have a lot of kids there. So I saw numbers that like it, more kids have been killed there than in the six months, than in four years in other conflicts. Like this is a massive toll of dead civilians and none of us should be comfortable with it, even those of us who support Israel. And, and, and I think that Biden is right to say this can't go on. And Matt, I take your point about Hamas not caring, right? I, I, I understand that like Hamas and the, and the civilians are a different thing. But the fact that Hamas is using these people as human shields does not erase the moral quandary that Israel is in. You just can't go out and kill 20,000 people, even accidentally. I mean, at 20,000, we're like beyond what's really acceptable, just in the, by, and just excuse it by saying, well, the bad guys are hiding behind them. I think we will disagree probably <laughs> on this. I'm pretty hardcore on this, man. And it's just the con. And I don't want to spend too much time debating it because, you know, it's, we're not going to persuade each other on, on the merits of this. But since you stated your position, I'll just state mine, which is like, first of all, you know, the Holocaust, <laughs> six million Jewish lives. Uh, then they create or the state of Israel. Um, and everybody says never again. And then obviously this has started with the Hamas attack on October 7th of last year, which uh, kidnappings, rapings, atrocities. Um, and this ends when Israel gets their hostages back. And like if Hamas wants to end this. And by the way, I think they were elected now many, many years at this point. It's like 20 years ago. Right. Uh, when Israel withdrew from Gaza. Um, but this is effectively part of their government. And um, they have now decided to hide in, you know, caves and underground, uh, you know, areas and, and use civilians as human shields. And if basically, if bad guys and terrorists can come into your country, commit atrocities and leave, and then you're not allowed to do whatever it takes to get your hostages back. And, and the international community punishes you for responding and attempting uh, to A, get your hostages back, and B, um, disincentivize future attacks, then it's just going to keep happening. I feel the same way, by the way, about Ukraine and Russia. Like if we if we allow Russia to invade Ukraine and then we cut a deal letting Russia keep what they took, then Russia is just going to keep doing it. You're rewarding the bullies and incentivizing bad behavior. So that's kind of where I am on this. But of course, the Ukrainians are killing Russian troops. They're not killing Russian civilians, right? Or they're killing mercenaries. But this is, I right, mean, this is a diff totally different paradigm because Russia is in Ukraine, whereas Hamas went into Israel kidnapped people and then left and fled and hot right and hit. but i <laughs> fled but and hit presumably the, like people like me would have similar qualms if ukraine went into russia to like give, you know the russia goes in and then the, they then the troops retreat into russia and if you it's, there's some number of russian civilians dead if russia were like if ukraine were the bully were the were the bigger power and where we would say that's wrong i mean I would, I, I don't, we're not going to settle this today, but you use the phrase, Matt, whatever it takes, doing Israel must do whatever it takes to defeat Hamas. And I understand the objective of defeating Hamas and making sure it can't attack Israel again. But 
I wonder about the whatever it takes part. I wonder why, what, like, what is your personal red line? What is, what is the point where you would say, okay, that's too much in pursuit of even, even a noble or good objective? Do we want to have this debate? <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 can, we, can, we can move on. We could do it, but I'm afraid the podcast is going to devolve into a... I, I don't think you and I would ever get mad at each other, but for the sake of the listeners, we'll just put a pen in it and say that you and I disagree on that. Okay. But what I do want to get to, we've talked about how this is impacting Joe Biden, and I think it's really squeezing Biden, right? I mean, it's hard to just... As you have pointed out, it's hard to justify what Israel is doing now, even if on October 7th, you were worked up six months later, we've seen some bad things happen. Um, what about Republicans? How is this, how is this impacting the Republican Party? And are they uh, standing firm with Israel? Or is there a schism on the right as well? Well, what really my problem, Matt, is that I wanted to write about that this weekend, and I can't. I what I, I thought that Republicans were going to come out and pounce when Biden said, "Hey, Israel's got to change," or we're going to. And I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing them holding back. In fact, uh, Mike Turner, the the chair of House Intel, was was on CNN uh, on Sunday, and he said basically what he, he described Israel's policy in. Um, his, it's Israel's behavior in Gaza, we said like haphazard. Uh, I don't think, did he say it was like incompetent or something? I'll have to look it up. But he, he basically criticized Israel's conduct of the war. I mean, look, Israel just killed like, a, you know, in a, in a drone strike, seven humanitarian workers. They've killed like 200 of them. Clearly, Israel is screwing some of that stuff up. So there are Republicans who think there's a screw up there. And those are hawks. I mean, Turner's absolutely a hawk. Um, so I think there's a sense that Israel doesn't exactly know what it's doing. But mostly I've been surprised that the Republicans have not pounced more aggressively on Biden for implying that U.S. support for Israel is somehow conditional. Are you are you what are you what are you saying? So for, first, I think it could be that the Republican Party, like Israel, is chaotic and not um, maybe not as competent as, as we thought they were. But the other thing is, I think I think the Republican Party is now very divided, which is not a, is that I don't think is a good thing. I mean, it used to be that you could count on the Republican Party to be the party, for example, to stand up against Russia's invasion and accuse Obama of dithering or leading from behind if 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 Russia invaded. Um, and now there's a lot of half the Republican Party, at least more probably, uh, who don't want to support Ukraine. I'm talking about elected members of Congress right now. And I don't think it's as I don't think it's that bad with Israel right now. I think there's more support for Israel. But I think the days of the Republican Party being like unconditionally supporting our allies and doing whatever it takes <laughs> to uh, bear any bear any burden. Just wait, that was a Democratic thing once upon a time. But you get yeah. my point. Right, right. Uh, I think I think those Reagan days. Or Kennedy days, but I think those Reagan days are probably over for the Republican Party. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so let's shift over. I, I, I thought we were talking about Israel. So, to, on Ukraine, me, obviously, major, well, I think major. I mean, I, th I think, I think that it applies to both. But we could talk about either one. Well, I, I see them as different. So, Beth, we could talk about that because that's an interesting idea. Like, remember when we were when the, when the Democrats were trying to pass the big foreign aid package, the security package. So it was Israel, Ukraine, border, Taiwan, right? And the Republicans were totally game for the Israel part of it. In fact, they like put that out as its own bill. And the Democrats were like, "Oh, you want the Israel part, so we're going to try to attach the Ukraine part to it." And the Republicans were like, "No, no, 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 no." So it's like it's like the teams have picked countries to to care about the Republicans caring about Israel and the Democrats about Ukraine. I think part of it, though, was, and I, there's some truth to that, but, Will, I think what happens is that whenever there is an initial attack or, or, or disaster, emergency, there is a like, knee-jerk Republican reaction that reverts back to its old self. So the initial reaction is to, it's the muscle memory, is to support our allies and give hell to our enemies. And I think it I think then it takes a few days for Tucker Carlson and Steve Bannon and Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Greene 
to get people spun up and like, oh, wait, we're, we're not that way anymore. We're, we don't need to defend Israel or Ukraine that much. So I, I think that um, the reason we saw that disparity was partly because Israel and Ukraine are different countries and also different circumstances, but partly because Ukraine happened later. And the, in each occasion, the initial response from Republicans is to uh, do what they would have done in 1985. And it takes a couple of days or weeks for the isolationism, the nationalism to emerge and, and become dominant. Uh, okay. So uh, first of all, I love your phrase muscle memory because it not it has the double entendre. It was the it's the uh, not only is it muscle memory, but it's memory of muscularity. <laughs> it's a, mem a memory of of a of a Reaganite foreign policy. That's good. I, I think that's true, but it's like what Trump did was sort of he took the whole macho thing of the Republican Party, which used to be about policy, and he just sort of gutted the policy. Like because Trump is in fact. The candidate of appeasement. He's the guy who's like, yeah, hey, tell the Ukrainians to cut a deal and give give away their land, you know, and, and then hope that 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 solves Putin's problem and we don't have to deal with Putin anymore. Um, so that there that reaction is there, but then the internal politics of the party, like uh, was it Turner and French Hill? I think there were some 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 of these sort of hawkish Republicans were out on TV saying, "We're the real Republican Party. The base is really the base is with us." And then there are these Tucker Carlson types and, you know, Fox News personalities who are isolationists, who are like undercutting. And it, that's gross. And they're just serving up Russian propaganda. I mean, I've, I love it when when these guys call out the isolationists who are just parroting the the, uh, the the Kremlin line. But in reality, I was looking at polls uh, yesterday, today on this. And in fact, there are more it is still true that more Republicans in polls say that we should be decreasing aid to Ukraine than say we should be keeping it the same or increasing it. Um, it was 60%, it's now 49, but it's still a plurality. The point is the Republican base has bought into the Trumpian isolationism. And so, I mean, God bless the Hawks for doing the right thing in Ukraine. But when they claim that they've got the base behind them and the party behind them, Matt, I think they're just wrong. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's wishful thinking and it's nostalgia and maybe it's like wish casting, you know, even. Um, but I think you're right. The energy, the excitement, the um, the wind is at the back of uh, within the Republican Party of the right, of the nationalists, of the populace. And again, though, I mean, domestically, that's problematic. But I do think that at the macro level, these policies um, have the effect of, of being provocative. They encourage bullies and terrorists and dictators to uh, assert themselves, right? And so Donald Trump's secret plan to end <laughs> the war in Ukraine, for example, uh, as far as I could tell, the secret plan is give Russia some of the <laughs> land. And I just think that, think of the message that sends China, among other among other externalities, it sends a pretty good message to China that, oh, you feel free to take Taiwan, you know, go for it. What are we going to do? You know, it's not our, yeah, I, not our rodeo. It, it, it's just amazing to me. Like, and, you know, I, I can't say it any better than you would, because all of every conservative who grew up like admiring Reagan and Reagan's foreign policy and the fall of communism and all that, just like the, the whole concept of deterrence. People say like, oh, Liz Cheney's a rhino. Like Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney and people like that, they're just like what's left of, I mean, I feel like it's the, the new Republican party that's the rhinos because they've taken this party that believed in a message of deterrence and they've, they've, they say exactly the opposite. So the, the, so the Washington Post story about Trump's secret plan is like, what's the plan? Well, like all Trump's plans, it's not really a plan. It's just sort of make it go away. What's the quickest way? And in, remember, Trump is perfectly transactional. Nothing, need, he doesn't care about anything but himself. You want land in Ukraine? What do I care about land in Ukraine? You know, give it, give it to Putin. So the plan is to let Putin have Crimea, which he invaded, and then him have, you know, the, the Donbass, which he invaded. Um, and they, they, what the Russians claim, they annexed it, right? And 
and his and his excuse is the same excuse he gave in previous years, which is, oh, the people there don't really mind. They'd be happy to be with Russia. You know, no concern about the message this sends. Right. The they asked the Trump, the Post asked the Trump campaign and the Trump campaign spokeswoman says her response to the story is President Trump is the only one stopping, the only one talking about stopping the killing, which is like a, what used to be a lefty pacifist message. You know, yeah. how do we make the killing stop? Give the dictator what he wants. Give the aggressor what he wants. And as you say, I mean, there's China, Trump, uh, Putin, sorry, I got Putin and Trump confused for a second there. Putin's like threatening to put more it troops happens. on the border with, <laughs> he's threatening to put troops on the border with Finland. Like, I don't think he's going to invade Finland exactly, but like, you know, why not? Like when, when, when America will just roll over and let you have whatever you take. I would just recommend not doing it on skis in the winter, but you know, <laughs> they'll do what they'll, they'll do what they're going to do. Uh, you know, another area, Will. maybe we'll end on this. Uh, well, no, I, I want to end on, uh, Caitlin Clark. Um, but we'll end the political portion of this episode on this, you know, you're talking about the whole ri- who is a rhino and Donald Trump just this morning, you know, we're talking on Monday, gave this um, sp- not speech, but a statement, put out a statement, a video statement of his position on um, on abortion. And it's sort of like his position on Ukraine, which is it's not really a plan. The plan is to let what was going to happen happen. Right. The Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, which sends the decisions back to the states. Donald Trump's big announcement, his big plan is it's been sent back to the states. OK, now the problem, though, is that there are a lot of pro-life conservatives, uh, including Mike Pence and Lindsey Graham and groups like the Susan B. Anthony list uh, who think, hey, if abortion is killing an unborn child, um, then just sending it back to the states isn't really good enough. Like uh, we should maybe have a federal law, a 15 week ban, a six week ban, some week ban at some point um, to protect unborn life. And uh, I don't want to get into a debate about abortion, but my point is Donald Trump, once again, who's cast himself as the ultimate conservative, the definition of being a conservative today, being a conservative Republican is being with Trump. And here he is, in a way, squishing out on this abortion issue. If Mitt Romney had done this, they'd be throwing everything at him but the kitchen sink. Fox News, Levin, Hannity, Tucker, all those people would be like talking about what a sellout. And you're going to get a little, you, you, you get a couple of tepid remarks from the peanut gallery about Trump. But by and large, Trump gets to do what he wants. And that makes it. It's like when Nixon said, if the president lies or if the president does it, it's not illegal. Right. Like if Trump does it, it's not liberal (laughs) by definition. Totally. I mean, look, all these other issues we've been talking about are technical, right? They're like, what policy do you support to achieve sort of an objective that most people agree on? Abortion is not one of those issues. Like, what's your moral position on abortion? And you and I, Matt, we don't have to have this argument. Like you're pro-life and I'm pro-choice and there's some some subtleties around the, you know, our disagreements, but neither one of us is Donald Trump because Donald Trump just doesn't believe anything, right? He does, Donald Trump is a, just a completely morally vacuous person. He, he doesn't care about the Ukrainians. He doesn't really care about the Israelis. He doesn't, he'll, you know, he'll cut and run on anyone. And here is an issue where people who are genuinely pro-life believe this is that human beings are being killed at scale lots and lots of human beings, that it is morally wrong. It is like to them, it is like abolition, right? And you, the abolition position is you should try to end this, not say, hey, you can have free states, you can have slave states. But Trump's position is he, whatever, what is the politically safe thing for him? And the safe thing for him is if you want to be in a pro-life state, you can have your policy. If you want to be in a pro-choice state, you can have your policy. And, and I'm not going to say anything beyond yeah. that. Except then in that same statement, and by the way, I put out a video earlier today where I went through literally and just played the statement and weighed in on every few sentences. But at some point he starts talking about how like everyone needs to make this decision for themselves. Every family. No, your state will make that decision for you. I guess you could leave and go to another state, but you're not 
like what you're now describing, Donald Trump, is being pro-choice, <laughs> actually. Yes. And that's not what you're for either. So um, it is uh, inscrutable. And he is all over the place, as as he always is. And you know what, though? I will say, and I mentioned it in my other podcast earlier, uh, where it was just me playing the clip. But um, I think it's really good politics, actually. I mean, I think it probably will be a political, a very smart politically uh, that he is staking out this position that appears moderate, actually. Yeah. Well, he's saying nothing. He's making it look like a something, but he's saying nothing, which is this, definitely the safest thing to do on this issue. OK, but something not safe to do is to criticize uh, the uh, Caitlin Clark, the star uh, college basketball player. Look, I, the only thing I could talk to you about somewhat intelligently are the Orioles, who had a disastrous weekend in Pittsburgh. <laughs> we won't go there. Um, but I did watch a little bit of the game yesterday, the championship game, um, which I think South Carolina actually won. But, uh, Will, I am led to believe, via our emails, that you may think Caitlin Clark is actually over, more overrated than the Eclipse. I think is how you put it. <laughs> No, I, I won't say she's more overrated than the Eclipse because the the, the rate the the Eclipse hype is unstu is is um yeah, there's no parallel for it. Um, look, Caitlin Clark is amazing. She is truly amazing at shooting a basketball, right? And she can hit from Steph Curry territory. She can hit from the logo. Um, it's it's unconscious. And I, as somebody who is a terrible terrible shooter, I can't describe to you how bad a shooter I am in basketball. I, I admire, I envy this skill she has. But it was what happened in the finals of, of this tournament was that a team, Iowa, with a great shooter ran into a, a, a really good team with a bunch of people who play well. You can see that, I mean, it's a team sport. And when Caitlin, you just, I felt bad for her because she had to, she got the ball stolen from her several times. She could not get open for a shot. She didn't have any, you know, she, other people on her team weren't creating enough of a distraction that she could get open. Um, and, but also, she's just, her game is somewhat limited. And Matt, this is, this is terrible. A thought I had during this game, I think if I were draw, picking in the, in the uh, WNBA draft, I think I'd take that center from uh, Cardoso from South Carolina before I'd take Caitlin Clark. Now, in reality... They're going to take Caitlin Clark and they're going to take her because if you're running a WNBA franchise, you want to put people in the seats and people yeah. will come to watch Caitlin Clark shoot the ball. And again, a glorious shooter, right? But if you want to win, I think maybe you'd pick somebody with a more of an all around game. Well, again, I don't know much about basketball, but I, I can tell you in football, oftentimes the Heisman Trophy winner does not make a great NFL star or quarterback that there is a it's a different game and maybe that will be the case in the wnba or maybe you will eat your words and i will play this video <laughs> every time you come back on as this she will becomes be my, this will be my worst take of the year i'm strong candidate for, you know you, you know you've had this you know when you, something comes out of your mouth and you're thinking to yourself matt this is going to be this is going to be the take that haunts me right that, what i would mine. say is um do not email me Email Will Salatan. <laughs> you can uh, send your vitriol and hatred on threads. And how can people tweet you, Will? Oh, <laughs> well, you want me to give it away now? I think you should give it right now. <laughs> At Salatan, you can you can get you can get to me on, on Twitter that way if you want to. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, in spite of the atrocity that you've just committed, um, <laughs> always a pleasure. We I think we had two at least two controversial discussions. Never descended into vitriol, animosity, anger, pettiness, uh, all that stuff. So thank you, Will Salatan. Always a pleasure. Thanks for coming back. You too, man. Always, always fun to talk to you.